get started. Um, so our last two internal Fragment speakers, Sigal and Clayton, uh, both mentioned um, GIT quotients in their talks. And so, and when or if I give a fragment talk, it's also going to be about GIT quotients. And so, I thought it'd be a good idea in in this seminar to give kind of an introduction to what they are. So roughly what it is, is it's, it's how to take a quotient of uh, algebraic variety by a group and get something that's still an algebraic variety. So it's how to take quotients in algebraic geometry is, is this topic. So let me just um, give a few pages of motivation first. Um, so let me remind you how we do quotients in other contexts. So in particular, the the easiest setting is in topology. So if x is a topological space, and I have a group action, on x, then I can define the quotient space, or the orbit space, uh, x mod g is just the set of all orbits. So that means the set of, you know, I, I take a point x in x and I look at all the places it can go when I act on it by g, and that gives me an equivalence relation on the points in x, and it's those equivalence classes. So this is an equivalence class. And the set of such equivalence classes I denote by x mod g. Um, but if x starts out with the extra structure of a topology, we'd like to give this orbit space a topology as well. Um, and the way we do that is as follows. So notice that there exists a map from x to x mod g, which just sends a point in here to its equivalence class. So it's surjective, but very much not injective. And whenever you have a map like this, and you've got a topology here, then you can define a topology here. Uh, basically, you just define it so that pi is forced to be continuous. So in other words, um, you just declare any set in x mod g to be open if and only if its preimage is an open set of x. And that's called the quotient topology. And if you define it this way, then pi is obviously a continuous map. Um, OK. So if we're trying to do something like this in algebraic geometry, uh, remember that varieties have more information than just a topology on them. They also have, uh, you know, on open sets, on open affine sets, we have the set of polynomial functions. So we're also talking about um, the, the functions on a variety. And that's part of the data that we're going to have to incorporate when we take quotients. And so to think about functions, let me uh, point out one nice thing about this construction is that it has the following universal property. Which is that if I have a map from my original space x to, to any other topological space, and it's g invariant, by which I mean that uh, constant on orbits. So f of gx is equal to f of x for all g and all x. Then I get an induced map so f is constant on orbits and so I can say where a, a whole orbit goes and so I, it allows me to define a map from 
x mod g to z. And it comes from x, uh, which we can phrase as saying that the composition of this f bar with this map pi is, is equal to f. What does this have to do with uh, functions on the quotient space? Well, for instance, if I let my z, my space z here, be something like r or c, then all of a sudden I'm talking about a function on the quotient space. Okay, so this kind of intuition is going to help us figure out how to define quotients in algebraic geometry. So in algebraic geometry, you have x variety. And as we've seen in 672, we also have this thing ox, which tells us what all the regular functions are on any open set of x. Um, so I'm going to define you know, our first kind of uh, guess for what a, what a quotient should be. So let's say we're given a variety x and g, uh, OK, so there's some adjectives that I'm just going to ignore to keep things simple. And I'll just say something with nice group. I'll give you some examples later. But let's say we have some group acting on x. Then I'm going to make the following definition. A variety y. is what's known as a geometric quotient of, of x by g. If, so I'm just going to sort of copy all the stuff we did in topology. So first off, uh, if there exists a morphism or a map, which again I'll call pi, from x to y, such that the following holds. So first, I want it to be g invariant. So it sends, you know, it's constant on corpus. And secondly, you know, it, it should be better than that. Really, this y should be like an orbit space. And so the way to phrase that is that the fibers, in other words, the pre-image at any point in Y, the fibers are orbits of the action of G on X. Okay. So all I'm saying is uh, for any point in Y, The image of that point is the orbit of x for some x. Do you require it to be zero technical stuff? Yeah, so this second condition is implying that it's okay. And then it would be a bijection from the set of orbits? That's right. That's exactly what this is saying. So, you know, it wouldn't be a terrible idea to call y x mod g. But it has more structure than a topological space. Um, OK, so next we're going to say the same thing as before about the topology. So u and y is open if and only if the preimage of that set is open. Same as before. OK, and now I'm going to say something about what are the uh, polynomial functions on y. 
So the fancy way to say it is that OY is the push forward pi lower star, the G invariant part of OX. But all this is saying is that functions on Y are exactly coming from G invariant functions on X. So in down to earth language, um, for all you open in Y, the set of regular functions of Y on U is exactly equal to, well, I take the functions uh, of X on the preimage, so I look at OX, regular functions on the open set, which is the preimage of U, and I look at the G invariant ones, and that should give me all the functions on U. satisfies all these properties, then you're in business, right? Um, and you should call that the quotient. The problem is, in algebraic geometry, uh, in a lot of cases where you have a really natural situation of a group acting on a variety, uh, such a geometric quotient doesn't exist. And so, um, so that, that's kind of why this subject is difficult, is that usually, we just aren't so lucky. There is no variety Y satisfying all four of these properties. Do you have like so, a quick example to illustrate? Yeah, I'll give you an example coming up, yeah. And I was, when, when you said it's a nice group, is nice meaning like when it's nice enough this thing exists? Or is it like more than that? It so we want it to be a, like kind of a group coming from algebraic geometry. Mm -hmm. So it should be itself like a variety or something. So for oh, instance, like, um, GLN is yeah. a good so example. So you mean like an algebraic group when you say nice? Yeah. Okay. But it can't be like Z1, 2Z or something? So, I mean, for some of these definitions, that's fine. But for a lot of applications, that's not good enough. Mm -hmm. so uh, yeah. Uh, so, um, I mean, the way we talk about, or at least in 672, projective varieties, are they not sort of just an example of this structure? Because you, yeah, okay, we, we will, we will. Right. That is, that is the example to look at. So I'm, I'm building towards that for sure. Yeah. Do you need more than algebraic group? Yeah. So for things to work out well, you'd like a reductive. Group. Uh, I was yes. going to ask if reductive is yeah. yeah. Yes. That's right. I mean, I think you can define a lot of these things without that condition, but in terms of computing, mm -hmm. that's usually what you want. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so. But then like still these GOT quotients might not exist, you're saying, even if it's a nice reductive object. Well, I haven't defined a GIT quotient. Right, the right, geometric right. quotient yeah. probably won't exist. That that's right, anyway. no matter how nice G is. Interesting. Um, yeah, so by nice for, for us for today, yeah, I mean, reductive is certainly like the right adjective to have, but um, let me just give you examples of the kinds of groups. So C star, which is C minus the origin, that's a group. C star to the n is, is a group, um, the general linear group, and a special linear group. So these are sort of the three main examples that I'm used to thinking about. Um, okay, so assume G is like one of these three and it's acting on some variety x. Here's, here's something that's uh, not as good as a geometric quotient, but still maybe deserves to be called a quotient. And, and they exist more often, so a categorical quotient. It's basically going to be something which satisfies that universal property that I wrote up before. In, in the category of varieties. So it's a scheme or variety y to 
together with a G invariant morphism. So always a quotient is more than a space. It's, it's a map from your X to a space. Um, now, satisfying the following properties. So for any uh, scheme or variety Z with a G invariant function, G invariant morphism from X to Z. The fact that it's G invariant, um, you know, means we should be able to get an induced map on the quotient space, and so that's going to be the universal property. Um, so for any Z and a map F, there exists a map F bar. From y to z, coming from f in some sense. In other words, uh, f is equal to the composition of f bar with with this pi. Okay, so that's that's a categorical quotient. It's just a variety which satisfies this property. And as with many universal properties. If you can find such a y, it turns out that it's unique to isomorphism. So this is basically the same as the like topological quotient you defined before. Well, yeah, I mean the topological quotient kind of had all those nice properties that yeah. a geometric quotient had as but well. But like this is like yeah, but this is this is copying that that yeah, last exactly. property. That's right. The way you prove it's unique is, you know, if you had a y and a y prime, then this property induces maps from one to the other, and then you can show that they're inverse to each other. Um, furthermore, you can prove, can be proved that a geometric quotient is a categorical quotient. So if you have a geometric quotient, then it is unique as well, and it's a categorical quotient. Okay, so now comes the main example. By the way, these often don't exist as well, so we, we're still going to have to keep working, as we will see. So let's choose the simplest group from these examples, which is the complex numbers minus the origin. And I'm going to have it act on the simplest variety, which is just affine space A. Okay. And the action is going to be by scaling the coordinates. So lambda um, times some v1 through vn. I'm defining the action to just be lambda v1 through lambda vn. Okay. So, you know, in particular, with the categorical quotient, you could let z be a1, so that you're looking at just uh, you know, functions on X. And what this is saying is that the functions on the categorical quotient are going to be exactly the G invariant functions on your X. And so we want to uh, use that fact. So the, the ring of algebraic functions on X is just the polynomial ring. Another way of saying this is x is the spectrum of the string. And so what are the g invariant functions? Well, um, it's the degree zero functions. So just the constant functions. 
are the only G invariant polynomials because anytime you have some higher powered monomial, it's going to get scaled by lambda to the D if D is the degree of the monomial. So the G invariant functions on X. And if you think through this for a little while, what it's going to imply is that, um, I'm not going to prove it here, but that you can get a categorical quotient, but it's just a point. Which I'm thinking of as the spec, the set of maximal ideals in the ring of G and variant. So this is a categorical quotient. Um, I, th I think I misspoke a second ago when I said that categorical quotients don't exist that often. Maybe they do exist pretty often, but they're often not very useful. Is That's what the problem is. Because in this case, yeah, we do have a categorical quotient, but it's... Um, you know, the really the most trivial possible map from X is just collapsing everything to a point. Mm -hmm. So it's not really remembering any of the information whatsoever about the group action mm -hmm. of G on X. Sorry, is this claim here saying that's the category quotient for the example we're working with? Yes. Okay. We have we have found our quotient. Okay. But we're we're not happy because it's not very interesting as an algebraic variety. Mm -hmm. And the problem with this, as you can see, is there's very few G, in, G invariant functions. And the categorical quotient really is um, somehow coming from looking at G invariant functions. And there's just, there's just no G invariant functions except the trivial functions, the constant functions. So we're losing sort of all the information. Another way of saying it is that uh, the G invariant functions don't tell us anything about the orbits of this group action. What you would like is like, for any two separate orbits, you'd like to find a G, G invariant function that was zero on one orbit and non-zero on another. Because then that function, you know, its image, uh, those two orbits would go to different points. And we just don't have that property. So the idea, the solution to this is to, instead of looking at functions, look at something else. Something more general. Involving this group. And so here's what you do. Yeah. So if we take the same action, but on the n minus the origin, is the categorical quotient and the geometric quotient both protected spins? Yeah. Okay. And then uh, they match, they match let me think for a second. Could you repeat the question? Oh, I'm sorry. I said if uh, if you take x to be an minus the origin instead of just all of an, and you take the same action, I mean, the obvious quotient is a projective space, so you mentioned n minus 1. And I was just asking if that's both a categorical and geometric quotient, or one of them, or the other. It, it um, is. We're, I think working, it's we're working towards it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. Mm -hmm. Cool. OK, so um, we're going to make a choice now. I'm going to choose an action. So I have, I have my g acting on x. I'm going to choose an additional action of the same group g on c, or on a1. And, and you get to make a choice. There's 
different ways of doing this. Um, so the, the action I'm going to choose is I'm going to let lambda times some complex number L. I'm going to define this to be, maybe I'll write it this way, I'm going to define this to be lambda squared times L. So this is, this is a well-defined group action of, in this case, C star on C. And once you've chosen an action of G on C, rather than looking at the G invariant functions, you can look at the G equivariant functions. Those that commute with the two G actions. Given some group G, we choose two separate actions for it. So in general, what you are given is an action of G on X. You want to take some sort of quotient. And the choice you will make is a choice of a single action of G on C. Oh, so you have an action of G on X and G on C. You have an action of G on X, and you choose an action of G on C. So once you do that, you have both, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so in, in our case, I'm looking at uh, the set of functions from CN or AN. I'm looking at G equivariant functions, so set of functions from CN to C, such that um, F of lambda applied to V1 through VN, this should equal lambda applied to f of u of n. And in our case, the action here was scaling. So this is f of lambda v1 through lambda va. And here the action was scaling by lambda squared. So this should be equal to lambda squared times f of v1 through vn in our example. So, uh, what are some polynomials on CN that satisfy this property? Homogeneous. Yes, degree two homogeneous polynomials all work. So we're looking at the set of F. Um, homogeneous of degree 2. Like the function z1 squared, right? So if I scale z1 by lambda, that's the same as scaling z1 squared by lambda squared. z1, z2 works, z2 squared works, etc. So the basis is going to be just given by Degree two monomials. Okay. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to use these, they're not G invariant, but they're G equivariant functions to give me an embedding of my quotient uh, into some space. So these are going to be the coordinate functions that, that give me an embedding. Now, if I have a bunch of these, and I consider them as coordinates, this is giving me a map to some like big CN, which is not quite uh, well-defined on equivalence classes of orbits, but it's well-defined up to some scaling, in this case, scaling by lambda squared. But we know a space where the set of points are equivalence classes in CN up to scaling in that's projective space. So if I think of these as my coordinate functions, they don't give me a map to some affine space, but they do give me a map to some projective space. And so I get a map 
this from <coughs> sorry, I'll call this a and to projective space. So how many coordinates are there? Um, I guess it's n plus one choose two. So projective space of this dimension. Okay. Now there's one small problem here which is that all these homogeneous degree two, cord degree two uh, polynomials. The, the variable is n, n number of variables. Yeah, n. But why there's n plus one? Oh, I, I don't know. It's just however many there are. Is this the right answer? I think that's right. Um, yeah, I think so. Okay. Wait, it's, uh, sorry, how, what do, which ones are you counting exactly? Just the homogeneous degree uh, n yeah. polynomials? Degree two. Oh, there'll be two. Yeah, that's right. Okay. But the problem is uh, all of these functions are zero at the origin. And so I'm not quite getting a well-defined map from a n to this large projective space. Because at the origin, it would go to the equivalence class of all zeros, which isn't mm -hmm. a valid point in projective space. But I do get a map from a n minus the origin to projective space. And the idea is, I want to think of the image of that map as my quotient. I want to think of this map as sort of embedding my quotient into projective space. And in this case, the image is going to be exactly the image of the Segre embedding of Pn minus 1, um, the degree 2 or no, Veronese embedding. All right. So now the sort of uh, general definition. So given a choice of action, which I'll call theta, an action of G on the complex numbers, I say a point x naught in x is semi-stable if there exists some function from x to c, which is g equivariant. In other words, um, f of gx is equal to g times f of x, where the action here is coming from my action of g on c. You said that means the equivariant? Yeah, that, that, which is this property. Okay. Yeah. And, and secondly, I want this function to not vanish at x naught. And this is saying that I have basically a G equivariant function which sees X naught, has information about X naught. So the, the origin is sort of the bad point here. I'm saying X naught is semi-stable if it's not like, like the origin in this example. semi-stable points, and it depends on my choice of theta, my choice of actions, so maybe I denote it like that. Need a set of semi-stable points. Okay, now once I have this definition, um, I can look at 
maybe a basis of g equivariant functions. a map from the semi-stable locus, set of semi-stable points, to projective space, which sends the point x to the point of x, etc. up to f x. Okay? And this is constant on orbits. Because if I let g act on x, then that's going to um, scale each of these by the action of g on c. So it scales them all by the same thing, which gives me the same equivalence class in projective space. So if I call this map phi, phi is constant on orbits. In fact, the result is that the image of this map is the categorical quotient categorical quotient of not x, but of the set of semi-stable. It turns out that this locus is an open subvariety of x. Okay, and so this is called um, this is called the GIT quotient. Of x by g. And it's denoted kind of like a quotient, but you do a double dash and put theta down here to emphasize that it's not really a quotient of x because uh, we remove some of the points, and it depends on our choice of theta. What does GIT stand for again? Oh, yeah, I meant to say that. So GIT stands for Geometric Invariant Theory. Questions? Can you do this over any field, or you have to have an algebraically closed field, or you have to have a C? Uh, okay, so I'm, I'm pretty confident that well, I'm, I'm quite confident it doesn't have to be over C, but I don't know much beyond that. It seems to me like these definitions definitions at least seem to work completely fine in general. I don't know like which theorems go through and which ones fail. Any other questions? Okay. Um, now it turns out that is not necessarily going to be uh, a geometric quotient. In other words, the, the fibers of this map aren't necessarily going to be just in bijection with orbits. Uh, but we can, we can say the following. So we define semi-stable points. And um, there's something even better called stable. So a point x naught, which is semi-stable, uh, 
is called stable, if it has this extra condition um, that, that the dimension of the orbit is equal to the dimension of the group. In other words, there's not a positive dimensional subgroup of G, like a whole C star or something, that fixes the point X. The stabilizer of X has to be a finite, finite group, essentially. And if I, if I don't look at phi of the semi-stable points, but instead I restrict even further just to the stable points, then I get a geometric quotient. So, sorry. If I let XS, which is a subspace of XSS, denote the stable points, then if I look at the image of the stable points under this map, this is actually even better. It's a geometric quotient. I mean, I guess you might say to yourself, okay, well, let's just always look at the stable points because geometric quotients are better. The problem is, um, you know, if this is an open subset of this, then uh, essentially this thing has a good chance of being a projective variety, being compact, and this is often like an open subset inside there. And so if you want your quotient to be a compact space, um, which you often do, then you really want to look at the semi-stable points. Cool. Are you going to write down uh, what you said? Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> to record it though. Mm -hmm. uh, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll say it one more time. The GIT quotient, the quotient of the semi-stable points, um, is often a projective variety. And the image of the stable points, the, this, is often an open subset inside of there. And so if you would prefer to work with something compact, you really want to look at phi of the semi-stable points. Is the point of the algebraic so that this is a open and this is a risky topology, but if you don't have, but if you have a proof that's like Z2, but acting in a very nice way, like a, say a fixed point free involution, then you're still going to be okay? Um, my understanding of like why Sorry, I'm not sure. Um, in terms of like, so I don't know about finite groups. I think they're okay. Z is definitely like something very scary, which is weird, right? Managers <laughs> is like a really bad group to look at. Um, but. Where this theory is best behaved is reductive groups, which in my mind basically means they have a lot of um, subgroups isomorphic to C star. And when you have that property, then there's this very beautiful result that tells you sort of a really easy way of computing the semi-stable locus. And so for that reason, um, largely that's what people look at. So my my guess is like maybe if you're doing like Z2 or something, um, the definitions are fine, but uh, the theory for like how to compute the semi-stable locus and how to compute the quotients isn't as developed. Um, so you're saying this geometric quotient is uh, this image? Is yeah. X, uh, X um, modulated by G 
G in the geometry quotient sense. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. But before uh, X S mark G. Yeah. Uh, X S mark G. Ah, okay, okay. Uh, it's a geometric quotient of this locus. Which is X over S, X S. Okay. Yeah, so you threw away even more of your space X. Okay. Um, I want to just give like one other cool example, uh, which gets into a very fantastic field called variation of GIT. And the point is that this, this GIT quotient we've defined dependent on a choice of um, theta, choice of action of G on C. And you can make different choices and get different GIT quotients. And seeing like how these quotients vary as you change your choice of theta um, turns out to be really interesting and, and really useful in a lot of contexts. So let me just give one example where of, of like two different GIT quotients. So let's let C star act on A3 as follows. So not by not just by scaling. So lambda of x y z I'll define to be lambda x, lambda inverse times y, and lambda inverse times z. And there's two kind of natural choices for your theta that you can choose. First one I'll call theta plus, just scaling. And theta minus will act with weight minus one, so lambda applied to L is going to be lambda inverse times L. Okay. And um, these two choices are going to give us different semi-stable loci, and, and therefore different GOT portions. Okay, so um, if I choose theta plus, then to figure out the semi-stable locus, I want to look at maps from C3 to C such that f of lambda times x, y, z, so that's lambda x, lambda inverse y, lambda inverse c, is equal to lambda times f of x, y, z. And so uh, if we just start writing down things that have this property, certainly just the monomial x works, right? Lambda x is lambda times x. Um, or I could do like x squared. That multiplies by lambda squared. So then if I do x squared times y, that also works. x squared c. And in this case, there's infinitely many. But the degree of x has to be one more than the degree of y plus the degree of z, essentially. Right? And the thing to notice about all of these functions that are g equivariant is they're all divisible by x. And what that means is that any of these g equivariant functions is going to vanish if x equals 0. Which means if I'm in the locus x equals zero, it's not semi-stable. So x semi-stable is exactly whenever x is non-zero, then I have a G equivariant function that's non-zero. So I get C minus the origin, the x coordinates non-zero, and then y and z. Um, 
So I'm just going to choose the first three functions to look at, to define a map phi. It turns out that's enough. So it's going to go to P2, and I send XYZ from the semi-stable locus to X, X squared Y, X squared Z. Okay. Now notice that, uh, so, so we want to figure out what the quotient is, so we want to figure out what's the image of this map. And since I'm on the semi-stable locus, x is always non-zero. And so I can choose a representative here uh, where x is equal to 1. Right? And in fact, then, you know, the image, I can, I can really get any point as my second and third coordinate. So it's the set of all equivalence classes of the form 1, 1, y, z, where y and z can be anything. This is exactly the chart in P2 where the x coordinate is non zero. So this is isomorphic to A2. So my GIT quotient is affine space of two dimensions. Oh, okay. Okay, so the theta minus was the opposite power. By the way, I'll say in this case that the stable locus is actually equal in this case to the semi-stable locus. And so then you can really, as at least set theoretically, you can calculate the image by just taking the set theoretic quotient of x semi-stable by the group action. If I do theta minus, looking at C3 to C, Satisfying this condition. And so I get things like y, z, x, y squared, x, z squared, x, y, z, etc. So in this case, you see that to be semi stable, at least one of y or z has to be non zero. But they don't. So the semi-stable locus theta minus x can be anything, and then y z can't can't both be zero. Why do we have a lambda inverse on the right hand side of that equation? Oh, uh, because I chose my action theta minus my action is is a choice of action of g on c, which is lambda acting on L is equal to lambda inverse L. And so to, oh, be, not that. to be equivariant with respect to my theta minus choice of action uh, means that it has to be lambda inverse. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so that's exactly where the choice is coming from. Okay, um, let me just give the punchline here. In this case as well, x stable is equal to x semi-stable. And so the quotient here is just set theoretically this set modulo the equivalence relation that x, y, z is equivalent to lambda x, lambda inverse y, lambda inverse z. Well, if I replace lambda by its inverse, I could write the equivalence relationship this way. Y and Z are non, not both zero. And so um, if I let X equals zero, I have P1 as my quotient. And this weight minus one means I'm looking at the line bundle O of minus one over P1. Another way to say this for those in 672 is this is equal to the blow up at the origin of A2. And so, you know, from what we've been doing in 672, uh, one thing you'll notice is that this is birational to A2. And that's a general theme 
in taking different GIT questions with different choices of theta is often they're going to be birational to one another. And it's actually a good way of producing interesting uh, sets of varieties that are in the same birational Lowell's class. OK, so I'll stop there. So the I of GIT is invariant, right? Um, is, is the invariance with respect to birational equivalences, or like what? Is, I, I think it's just because we're like looking at invariant functions in some okay. sense. Okay, and then also, so since the blow up is realized as one of these, um, uh, is it typically uh, an approach or something? I don't know. To technique, so if you have a variety which maybe it's not so great, but you want to realize it as a quotient, and so then you sort of work backwards where. I, know, I mean, I know it's pretty vague, but in a hand wave sense, it's kind of how the book was sort of introduced, was we had this singular spot, and so we want to get directional derivatives of the most, you know, I don't know, but. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess um, what I would say is, is it, it turns out, and this is this like very amazing theorem, uh, which, which created the study of Mori dream spaces, but it, it turns out that tons of birational morphisms, or rational morphisms, I should say, uh, arise as variation of GIT. And that, that's sort of like kind of surprising a priori if the variety you started with wasn't defined as a GIT portion. Mm -hmm. But it turns out that, um, that that just actually happens to be a very common situation. But I think it's safe to say people were sort of surprised and delighted by, by that result. <laughs>